given that Eric Froelich's the sixth seed and Gary Wong's the three seed, Gary is going to get to play first. Did Gary Mulligan? I mean, I think Clyde from Raptors is a fine card. I wouldn't call it a mulligan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll take a look in a second here. It looks like he, he may have. He's One, got two, five cards in hand. So he's putting a counter on the Cloud Fin Raptor. So this is a good start, and especially if Ifu doesn't have a two drop. Whoa. All the Raptors get counters, but not, not, not quite that many. Paying two, paying two lives, so there's got to be another judge's familiar. Has right? to be. So he is down to two cards in hand. Yeah, that's So that's he true. did mulligan a six. But this is a, this is a strong start. I mean, that Cloud Fin Raptor's not going anywhere anytime soon. Those judges' right. familiars are going to do a very good job of protecting it, whether it's via countering Hero's Downfall or essentially countering Devour Flesh. Right. Though Ifro does have like does have a pretty reasonable hand. I mean, he's got lands, life bane zombie. He's got the two drop in devour flesh that he's just going to go ahead and run out here. Gary, of course, selecting to gain one life. <laughs> well played. We well, have to make up for uh, the pain land somehow. It looks like Cloudfront Raptor's going to evolve again. Though Gary much rather would have much rather done. Whoa! You can't actually cast Tidebinder Mage off that mana, <laughs> as Ifro is pointing out. So, <laughs> Godless Shrine has some drawbacks. That was close, though. <laughs> so then uh, that, that leaves Gary at attacking for two here and putting Ifro down to 17, which is still pretty high. I mean, it's very different than attacking for, for three and having another creature in play. And here is one of the drawbacks of playing the white. Yep, I mean, for sure. Gary actually cost himself a play by not being able to, to cast the Tidebinder Mage there. So that, that is a very, very relevant thing to point out. As good as Detention Spear is, he doesn't have an, you know, he has one in hand, but he hasn't cast it yet, and he was not able to cast Tidebinder Mage as a result. So Lifebane Zombie is going to give you for a look at Gary's hand, but obviously Judge is familiar, would have been far cast by now. Gary really just wants to draw land here, yeah, that's so he can by cast far his spells. Best draw. I mean, if he draws a land and can cast Thassa or Tide, if he draws land, I imagine he'd lead with Thassa, but if he doesn't draw a land here, Ifro is going to, you know, just outrace him. I mean, Gary had a good start, but he's really only attacking for two a turn. Ifro's yeah. already outracing him with Lifebane Zombie. Well, Gary did mulligan into a two-land hand. There wasn't much he could do. I mean, one of the lands happens to be his, Godless Shrine, but and actually his only Godless Shrine. Yeah. So that that that, that is uh, you know that is tough. I mean, it was obviously a very good keep. It's just it ended up not working out quite as well as he would have liked. So Ifra so has an Underworld Connections, which isn't always the best in this matchup, but in this situation, it's great, and it's going to give more devotion for the Gray Merchant, which he. Yeah, he Plus, does have Grey Merchant in hand. Yeah, which he plans to cast probably fairly soon. Yeah, Gary Wong has one, one Godless Shrine, and that, that one Godless Shrine, though, had it been uh, a Temple of Enlightenment, it would have actually been fine because he played it on turn two and played, he would have just not been able to play the second Clavfin Raptor. So, Ifro dropping to 12, but partially of his own doing, and Underworld Connections is, you know, easily a sacrifice he's willing to make here. Thought this is actually a pretty bad draw right now. Gary's got a handful of ca uncastable or ca cards. Well, the only issue is, Ifro does know one of those cards is Thassa. <laughs> it's true. I mean, Ifro knows Detention Sphere, Thassa, Tidebinder Mage. This is an opportunity to get rid of Thassa, but or Detention Sphere if he feels like he can win the race with the Lifebane Zombie and Grey Merchant. Yeah, which he's pretty close to doing. I agree. His higher path play is just is playing Erebos, God of the Dead here, which he could do, but he can't Thought Seize because he didn't hit the fifth land. And if he plays Erebos, Gary draws a land. Erebos gets Detention Sphere. That's not actually that bad no, for Ifro. No, that's fine for Ifro. I think given that it's, that's worst case scenario. It's not that bad for Ifro, and the, the payoff of hitting with Erebos is pretty high. Would you run Erebos, or would you... Looks like Ifro's actually running Hero's Downfall. I think probably followed by Thoughtseize, and he's okay whether... whether uh, or no, he's actually just going to draw the card, hope to hit a land here, right? So now, if Ifro casts Thoughtseize, he could get it countered by Judges from there. It looks like he's not willing to, to take that risk. I don't even think it's that bad to have it countered by Judge's Familiar there. Yeah, I think Gif given Ifro's at 11 and Judge's Familiar is going to hit you for one, given that you know Gary is going to want to build towards a Thassa here. What do you think Gary's hitting? All right, uh, I was going to guess Life Bane Zombie, but there's a there's a, a potential you know thought of hitting Underworld Connections. I would imagine Ifro kicks things off by using Underworld Connections. I mean, he could play Packrat here and have Packrat man up. That might actually just be the best. Yeah, he could also just lead with Thoughtseize to, to sculpt the rest of his turn based on Gary's hand. Yeah, he knows there's a Thassa sitting there, and he knows, he knows there's a Tidebinder Mage. Right. Uh, so Thoughtseize, I mean, he could potentially even do something like cast double Thoughtseize, but that puts him really close to dying to like Mutavault plus Judges Familiar. 
Well, he does have Grey Merchant, so he knows next turn he'll likely be able to gain four life. Yep. But that also incentivizes him to play a Pack Rat this turn. Yeah. Which he could also do and cast two Thought Seasons. Yeah. And then he ends up getting five life, so that actually could be, that could be enough of, a, of an incentive to just cast the Thought Seasons to take basically all the three drops. Time Better Mage is easily the weakest card in the hand, yeah. given, given that it takes all of Gary's blue mana if he even draws another mana. So Ephra's choosing to clear the way for Erebus, taking the Tension Spear. The fact that Thassa's not a really good follow-up here make, makes sense. This is a five-power creature. Yeah, I and mean, I mean, Ephra gets to play Grey Merchant, drain Gary for five, and attack with a five-seven creature. If Gary doesn't chump block, it puts him to one. Yeah. How much of a consideration do you think it is that uh, Erebus stops all of Gary's life gain? I, I guess Hugh didn't hear me there. <laughs> no, I, I, did someone say something? <laughs> Nothing relevant, actually. Okay, yeah. So Gary's in a tough spot here. He can cast a Cloudfin Raptor. Actually, that's the, and he can cast a Thassa. Cloudfin Raptor is the only spell he can cast that actually affects the board. Thassa could attack next turn. There's right now three Devotion, but the odds that Gary is planning to chump block with Judgment are pretty high, given that he didn't attack with it. Yeah, if he was going to chump, he would have attacked. Yeah. Or if he wasn't going to chump, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. And... Ephra drew a Muta Vault, so he, does, he even gets to use Underworld Connections or cast Thought Seize this turn. So, I, th I think that Ephra is almost a lock to win this, given that he's draining for five here. His, his life throws under no attack. Gary is almost in chump block mode already, and getting Thassa up to Devotion with one island in play is really, really hard. And he is in chump block mode. I mean, Ephra's two attackers combined are lethal. Yep. I mean, if Gary can somehow get Thassa active... He, can, he has a blocker for Erebus every turn, but given that Ephra has a handful of heroes downfalls, that does not seem plausible. And like you said before, Gary only has one blue-producing land in play. Like his top card here is Hallowed Fountain. He probably has to put it on the bottom and just hope to draw another Detention Sphere, his third. Yeah, I, I think that going for the Hail Mary Detention Sphere is probably his, his best play here. He could also play Master of Waves and, and make three, three tokens. Yeah. Three tokens might be enough to, to buy him some time, but of course he doesn't... Not only does he not know that Ephra has Hero's Downfall, I don't think he can even afford to play around it. Yeah, I think this play is actually fine. Like, if Ephra doesn't have a removal spell, it buys him quite a bit of time. I, I might consider, yeah, Ephra just revealing the Hero's Downfall, which is going to end the game. So taking a, lo a look at uh, Gary's sideboard here, see what options he's got available. And there we go. So he's got... Rapid Hybridization. He has an Aetherling in his sideboard, which is, is more for the Revelation decks. Yeah, I don't think... I don't think it, he's enough time here. I don't think I would board it in against a discard deck. He's got double Domestication, and, and he saw Lifebane Zombie, he saw Grey Merchant. I mean, Lifebane Zombie mostly rules out Night Vale Spectre. Yeah. Well, they do have deckless, so they'll know. He'll know. That's true. Yeah. They, they are going to get deckless here in a second. So, he, given that he knows all of Ephro's creature matchups, or creature pairings, would, would you board in Domestications? Well, there's another thing that is relevant with Domestication. I mentioned it a little earlier. If Ephro gets out multiple copies of Desecration Demon, you can take one and sacrifice it to tap the other one. You're, you're the second Hall of Famer to tell me that today, actually. Who's the first, Paulo? That, 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 we have narrowed it down to Because you Paolo. never would have thought of it. I would have thought of it if I'd seen it. Okay. But I've never run into it. You've just run into it at some point. Uh, maybe. I don't, I don't recall. I'm not giving you credit. No. Yeah, sure. <laughs> no, those, it's obviously a very good play yeah. and one that... Uh, Two out of three Hall of Famers were not saying which two <laughs> did, did think of. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that is relevant. I mean, it does give domestication some value in situations where you might think otherwise it doesn't have any. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a corner case, but it's not one of the, really, the ones that's irrelevant. It's right. a corner case that you really have to think about. It's the same thing as, you know, Devour Fleshing Your Desecration Demon. Like, it just comes up a lot. Yeah, and that comes up a lot. That comes Burn, up actually, actually a lot, yeah. yes. And, and knowing that, that that's an out is something also Ephra has to keep in mind. He knows there's domestications. If you have, you're probably not going to avoid playing a second demon if you, have, if you have nothing else to play. Right. But if you have another good play, it's plausible to think about. Right. So they're shuffling up already. I mean, given that they have deck list, this, it does make sideboarding a lot easier. Like, there's no more guessing game. It's not, you know, trying to predict what your opponent might bring in. So Ifro takes a quick game one, mostly because, you know, Gary didn't have a second blue source that entire game. Up until, I guess, the very last turn. Right. But, I mean, that was what's one of the drawbacks. If that Godless Shrine had been an island, right. and Tidebinder mm -hmm. Major had been in play, Ifro would not have had a, the life to spare to use Underworld Connections. I mean, yeah, like you said, that's a bonus of playing a multicolored deck when you draw two lands for the same color. Yeah. I mean, excluding Mutavault or something like that. But right, but the Godless Shrine wasn't a Mutavault because Gary already has the four Mutavaults. Right, exactly. 
Do you think uh, Gary's going to go ahead and choose to play first? I think so. I can't really think of any reason <laughs> why he would Actually, choose to draw I was this trying matchup. to think of a reason to, to, to draw, not in this matchup, just in standard in general, and I really can't think of one. I think even in the Esper matchups, it's just not a good idea to do so. Yeah, I agree. I, I always choose to play first in the Esper mirror, but there are arguments for choosing to draw. I just don't agree with them. Some people feel that like you're more likely to hit your land drops when you draw, but... Well, I mean, that, that is true. Well, That's a fact. Some people think... Th <laughs> I agree, but some people think that matters enough to make it worth it. In my opinion, being able to play your threats first is more beneficial. Agreed. I mean, I, I don't think it's much of a debate, but it is interesting. I mean, there have been matchups in, in constructed formats where I have chosen to draw first. just hasn't been for a while. Basically, since the type line Planeswalker appeared on cards, drawing first has just become a huge gamble. Right. Because now, it used to be that, you know, against aggro decks, obviously, you'd want to play first. Against the control decks, sometimes in the mirror, you want to draw because there's no big incremental advantage cards. Planeswalkers just completely change all that. Yep, for sure. So, we do kind of have a Gary versus Gary matchup here. As we see Gary oh, Wong on no. one side, <laughs> Gary Merchant of Asphodel on the other. Who do you think, who do you think wins the Gary please, matchup? There, there are please, four Garys please. in Ephra's deck. <laughs> please stop. <laughs> There's only three more rounds of this. <laughs> yeah. Eric is vulnerable to, to starts that are a little too fast because, I mean, the mono black deck, once it gets rolling, it's, its spells are much more powerful, like Grey Merchant draining for five, etc. But it does have, you know, only one play a turn up until then. In Cincinnati, Eric played two copies of Drown and Sorrow. Does he not have those in this tournament? Let's take a look at a sideboard. We do have deck lists here and see what, if Eric's got the Drown and Sorrows here. He's got, no, he's got zero Drown and Sorrows. He's got... Four Farika's Cure and two Doomblade that come in. So four Farika's Cure do help a lot against those really fast starts. Yeah, Judge's Familiar is still very good. It is. Judge's Familiar is a great card. I, I, yeah, again, I, I've said this before. I think this is, this is the best matchup for, for Judge's Familiar. I think it's quite good against the, the Revelation decks, too. It is good there, but the fact that Supreme Verdict and Jace both make, make it a lot less value is it annoying. Because it, sometimes it just basically doesn't trade for a card. Right. Against Mono Black, it always trades for a card. There's yep. just basically no situation where it doesn't. Okay, so Eric has a choice between Masquerades or Thassa. Almost certainly he's going to take Thassa here. Yeah. Not only is it, is it cheaper, so, it, you know, it... it Ephra has less time to deal with it. It's also the one permanent in Gary's deck, besides Detention Sphere, of course, that Ephra can never kill. Right. And Detention Sphere is just a removal spell. That's a, you know, a 5-5 five, five threat that makes things unblockable. And Ephra does have the turn two Pack Rat against a very slow draw from Gary. Well, you know, that's another thing worth mentioning. Pack Rat is actually much, much worse against the deck with Detention Spheres. Yeah, definitely. G given that Pack Rat's one of the best ways for Mono Black to beat the blue decks, I think adding Detention Sphere changes that a lot. We didn't actually mention that, but it's, it's very true. So Eric also with no third land. Yeah, this, we could be in a similar situation the last time, especially since Gary has drawn Night Veil, Spectre, and Cloudfin Raptor for relevant early plays. Though, even if Euphro has a third land here, doesn't he, doesn't he give thought to cast and devour flesh on the Night Veil Spectre? Oh, definitely. I think that's what he would cast, in fact. Especially because that Godless Shrine that casts the Night Veil Spectre allows Gary to cast Eric's Black Spells. Yeah, that, that's pretty awesome. The only downside here is the Rat only does one damage and Devoured Flesh does three, so you, you had a life total deficit on this turn. That is not necessarily a problem, Luis. <laughs> but, correct me if I'm wrong, the way to win the game is to reduce your opponent to zero life total. That is correct. Do you think, just a little off topic, do you think there's anyone in the world who laughs at their own jokes more than you? <laughs> uh, I barely ever laugh at my own jokes. Oh, but okay. <laughs> but I, I say that also no. <laughs> All right, so Gary just has a Cloudfin Raptor to play his turn. Has, he could have played a Master Wave. Decides a Master Wave for one is just not, not interesting enough. Eric again misses his land drop. And this is, this is tough because Devour Flesh is are just losing value rapidly. He, can, he does have a pack rat. Playing a second pack rat isn't bad. Unfortunately for Eric, he has a Thought Seize, but knowing that Gary has two Master Waves in hand, he doesn't accomplish anything. Gary drew a Detention Sphere. It is, as we saw, you know, Hugh give a disgusted look at that, at that draw. I mean, it, was a, it was a wince, not <laughs> disgusted look. <laughs> a disgusted wince at that draw. Was not disgusted. Stop lying. <laughs> Clifford Raptor evolves twice. That attendance sphere, I think, actually kind of seals Ephra's fate this game. Give, given the fact that Pack Rat is one of the best ways to win while you're mana screwed, I think it's going to be tough for, for Ephra to... It's definitely going to be tough, but he's not out of it. No, he's not, he's not out of it. 
I actually think it's slightly better for Ifro that he doesn't draw a land and start making pack rats given that there's a Tension Sphere. He might just cast Thought Seize this turn to take the second Master, if and he then had, he sees the Tension Sphere. If he had drawn a land, I think he would have Thought Seized and Doombladed and attacked. And, th and then we would have been in an interesting shape. What do you think Ifro takes here? He I, my, my guess is he has to take Master as painful as it is. Yeah. Is this dropping Ifro to 14? So that's 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. He does take 11 damage this turn. He takes a lot of damage. I mean, the Master doesn't attack, but... Yeah, it does. He he, oh, he took Detention Sphere. He took Detention Sphere. Biden is also a very interesting draw. Yeah, I, I, I think just slamming Biden looks pretty good there. I don't know. You, yeah, I agree. It's just too well, hard. Well, the fact that... You know, actually, no, no, no. I think you were right initially. The fact that the second Master lets the two Elementals attack past the two Pack yeah. Rats is definitely the tiebreaker there. Also, now Ifro can play successive removal spells and the elementals will die. Yeah. I mean, Ifro's still behind here. He, oh, he, he yeah. has to have double Doomblade and right now only has one. But if he draws a second Doomblade, he, you know, he, he has a possibility of getting out of this. The FASA that Carrie just drew is going to make that difficult. Yes. Though. All right, so Ifro just scoops him up. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, the fact that Gary had multiple permanents he couldn't answer, and the fact that he was on two lane and couldn't cast right. anything, made so that one a pretty tough comeback. Kind of similar games in which one player stalled on two lands for several turns and ultimately cost them the match, or the game, excuse me. Well, it is going to cost one of them the match <laughs> in, in the end here. Yeah, those games were pretty lopsided. I mean, yeah. n n neither game were, were both players able to get their, to get their uh, like, r r whole engine going. Also, if you enjoyed the coverage or didn't enjoy the coverage, we'd like to hear about it. So please let us know. You can also email me, lsv at channelfireball.com. Go ahead and read all my emails. He loves spam. <laughs> uh, you know, spam is all right. If you prepare it right, it, it actually tastes pretty good. I knew good. you were going to do that. <laughs> then why did you say it? You just set me I up. Said it after, I, I realized it after I said it. I feel like I'm a victim of Huey's trolling here, actually. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm trolling you. I, I trick you into making awful jokes, so you look bad. Yeah, that, that's, that's what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> So, I don't think that the you know the course of that game is going to change much sideboarding on either player's side. They they saw other player you know the other player's list. They like I don't think Ifro even reached for a sideboard, and if he did, it was very quick. <laughs> yeah, I agree. He might have just pretended to sideboard a card or something, but he knows how to sideboard in this matchup. Yeah, I mean, and, and even though he does, I think miss the drown and sorrows here since the, you know they're you're very good at fighting master of waves. Uh, Ultimately, Farika's Cure is a lot better against the Burn decks, which is why I think he made that choice. I agree. Also, you know, White Weenie had fallen off a little bit. And yeah, even though David Ochoa did play against White Weenie in Cincinnati, I think that was the only time either of them played against yep. it, and they expected to see none of it here. And I didn't really see much being played. I saw White Green, but White Green and White Weenie are not the same thing. The White Green deck's not vulnerable to John Star at all. It's, right. it's all Fleece Main Lions and Voices of Resurgence. Right, exactly. I mean, I guess it can kill Soldier of the Pantheon. An experiment maybe one, experiment but one, whatever. But yeah. I mean, there are definitely worse things for a white green aggro deck to see than Drown in Sorrow. Right. Like Life Bane Zombie, which <laughs> yes. is all over the place yes. at this point. I, I would ask which of the color hosers in that cycle is the best, but the fact that Life Bane Zombie has all of them, all the rest of them covered, put together. So. Ifro is going to be on the play now. The f again, the fact that Packrat is just not a card you can go all in on in this matchup really impacts how Ifro plays. Yeah, that was a really easy route to victory in a lot of games against the Mono Blue Devotion deck. Turn two Packrat on the play was almost unbeatable yeah, they unless they had a rapid hybridization on the spot. Or like some Nykthos in a Cyclonic Rift draw. <laughs> That's pretty tough. <laughs> Which is just hard to beat yeah, anyway. Right. Which, to be fair, is also harder to beat given that uh, if you're pack ratting, you don't really have enough time to be casting thought seasons and, and whatnot. Right. So if you're Ifro, given that pack rat is a little riskier, what are you looking to draw? Thought season into pack rat to take detention the thought sphere? Thought season into pack rat's great. Um, maybe just like a hand, I mean, a perfect hand would be something like thought seize into a doom blade, into a devour flesh, into. Underworld connections. Or I don't think that, zombie. Underworld Dex I was going to say Desecration Demon. Oh, Desecration Demon, you think that's the best threat? I think so. You want, But it has to... It's the best threat when your game plan works. When you're right. able to keep the board clear and put it onto a, an empty or close to empty board. Lifebane Zombie's great. 
You could go Thought Season's removal spell into Life Pain Zombie. That's a great draw. Yeah, it's just unblockable. Right. What if it what if it hits a judge's? I'm familiar? not even sure <laughs> Underworld Connections is in the deck after yeah. sideboard. I, I mean, I haven't played this matchup enough to to know whether you board it in or out. Or so you, you, your suspicion is that Ifu does not have many of those in the deck. Looks like is that six land Th Farika's Cure? Yeah. It looked like six land Farika's Cure, which is not very close to keepable. No. It would be kind of funny if it was six land Packrat. Would you keep it? Yes. And then just and just hope he doesn't have a detention sphere. I think. That's tough. Looks like they are both mulliganing. Yeah. Though. That probably favors Eric. Yeah, I, I, I think that Eric's cards don't need much help from the other cards here. So the fact that, you know, Gary is mulliganing, like we've said many times in this, in this broadcast, the blue deck's a synergy deck. It's, it's worth right. repeating. And, and in general, if you're both going to mulligan and make your card count and you know, card selection lower and lower, the deck with Thoughtseize is going to be able to better capitalize on that. Right. Especially since, going back to the same theme, the blue deck is hurt more by, like, a blue deck that Mulligans against Thoughtseize could easily have a hand of, like, a bite and a tendency and nothing else. Exactly. And, and it's a two-color deck, and Eric's deck is a one-color deck. Although it's black-red devotion, there's no red cards in his deck yeah. right now. The only, the only amount he's hurt by that is that he, if he has to pay life off Blood Crypt, that's a penalty. Sure. It does not stop him from casting spells. He would have played as many or more temples anyway. Yep, definitely. And from Gary's side of the board, I mean, the, all you're looking for is a hand that has like a Judge's Familiar, a two drop, and a three drop. I mean, yeah. that, that's basically all, you know, your best hand. I think you'd still rather have the Tidebinder Mage in your hand, even though Detention Spheres and Thassas are better overall. I think that playing a card on turn two is probably, is probably worth it. Yeah, maybe you'd favor Frostburn Weird a little bit. That's true. Yeah, but still. And I think Judge's Familiar is with the card you'd rather see over Cloudfin Raptor early, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure. In this sure. matchup, in a game where both players have mulliganed and are likely to have land light hands, I think I agree. I and think Efro has the turn two pack rat with Immutable. That's what it looks like. And given that, I mean, you know, what, what choices does he have? He's going he's gonna to go for it. And Gary's, Gary's has four land, two of which are Immutables, a Biden and a... And another Biden. <laughs> oh, was it two Bidens? Yeah. <laughs> So Ifro has two mutavolts. Oh, and Ifro drew a Thoughtseize. Is, is mm -hmm. what it looks like? No, no. he did not. Is a, no, a second mutavolt. So Ifro is in the position where I think he's just going to make pack rats here. I agree, and I think it's going to be good enough unless Gary managed to draw a detention sphere. Yeah, I mean that that, that is what it's going to come down to. So interestingly, oh, Ifro has has a, a duress. At this point, do you, do you just duress and attack for four? Um, for because he has a second mutavolt, he can activate. Right, right. I think I would have just attacked for one and passed. And just, and that and way, if he has a detention sphere, you don't lose two cards. Because if he detention sphere right, pack exactly. rat, you don't have and to lose two cards. My plan would have been to make a pack rat at end of turn and hope to draw a swamp so I could duress next turn and still make a pack rat. And Gary's running into problems with mana still. He drew a Night Vale Spectre, but he yes. drew triple mutable. Yeah. And that has nothing to do with him playing white. No, not at all. I mean, he, he's still going to have all those mutavolts in his deck. So Gary, leaving back the Judges from there because it can threaten a block, <laughs> you feel in a kind of funny spot with Triple Mutavolt here. Triple Mutavolt's very good with Pack Rat. So now Ifro gets to attack, and Gary's plan of double blocking the Pack Rat no, no longer works. No longer works. <laughs> activate three Mutavolts. There, there's potentially up to five Pack Rats in play right now. So one thing Ifro can do is that I, when, when he. In a few turns, he can stop making rats on his own turn. If yeah. he has three rats in play, he can just wait and devour flesh himself in response to the targeting ability of Detention Sphere. Yep. Fizzle the, the effect and keep whatever pack rats he has left. Yeah, he's, only, he's actually only one turn away from that, and now he's just going for the extra damage. He does need a swamp. Yeah, he's, he's, he needs his fifth land to be a swamp. Gary has about a turn to draw a Detention Sphere, which he did. So, Ifro's going to be in a tough spot now. I mean, Ifro does have Desecration Demon in hand, and Desecration Demon is still going to be very good. And Gary still can't cast Night Veil Spectre, but if Ifro doesn't draw a Swamp here, then he's, he's going to be unable to, to get much going. And actually discarded the Desecration Demon to the pack, right? He's just, he kept the Grey Merchant. I think Ifro might still be in okay shape here, given that he gets to, he can Thought Seize the, the, the second Bident, or the Night Veil Spectre here. 
What, what would you be more likely to take? I mean, he, Gary can't cast the Spectre. It's would, a better card, but would, he can't cast I, it. I would take the Biden. Yeah, and it looks like Ifro agrees with that. But Ifro's in a lot of trouble. He is. Gary's at this point drawing to any any land other and any any good spell. And, and in fact, Master of Waves is, might actually do it. So three elementals later, and Ifro's under a very fast clock. If he draws a land and he can cast Grey Merchant, then he, those elementals wouldn't necessarily be able to attack. But Temple of Malice is not the land he's looking for. At this point, he just wants a way to deal with that. Master of Waves. Yep. So, a scry land for Gary will allow him to play Mutavault, or sorry, to play Night Vale Spectre next turn. But it is it is the worst land Gary could have drawn yeah. that wasn't a fourth Mutavault. I'm not even so sure. Fourth Mutavault is an extra 3-3 three, three attacker. Yeah, fourth Mutavault might actually have been better. <laughs> Gary choosing not to attack with the other, other Mutavaults here, which is interesting. So Gary attacking, threatening what would be 10 damage. Because the Mutavault's getting a bonus from the Master of Waves. Right. Would you double block Mutavault here? You could potentially also block two elemental tokens. That, I'm guessing, is not great. I, mean, I would it, not do that. Yeah. Double block Mutavault's the only other consideration. Ifro may be counting on, on being able to kill the Master of Waves next turn. Well, at least hoping. Well, in order to, in order to have... You know, he just at the bottom, he drew another Temple of Malice. Given that he can't kill Master Waves now, he can play Grey Merchant, but that would still be enough. Yeah. So, that was, that was an interesting match. I mean, it came down to the detention sphere. That was the card that gave Gary yeah. the edge. Yeah, I mean, and, and like you said, it's, it's important against the mono blue deck. That kind of draw probably would have won the game from Efro's side, but because he played the white, because he had the detention sphere, the white splash really paid off, and, and that's what Efro said. Well, he has the tension sphere. That's one of the best cards. Yep. And unfortunately, he was proved right. So we have Art McCurda versus William Levin, and they're both John, and they both have monsters. And we and we haven't we haven't seen this particular matchup line up. So, I mean, given that both these guys are just playing haymakers and removal spells, I, we're just going to see some back and forth Let's here. Hope. Like, and it's kind of hard for, for either player to do anything too broken besides something like Rakdos Return. Which could, can clear out removal or punish a slow draw. They also both have Courses of Crucifix, but I don't know how, how much you can afford to use something like a Dreadbore or a Mizzy Mortars on a Corset of Crucifix, given that your opponent's got Stormbreath Dragons, Polychronos, right. you know, Gore Clan Rampagers, that, you know, Reaper of the Wilds, that sort of thing. But in a matchup where there's not a lot of incremental advantage to be gained, Course of Crucifix can do that. And you see Art doesn't have Sylvan Carrotid or Corsa of Crucifix or Elvish Mystic or Domi Red. So given all those things, that what William can you know, be pretty confident in narrowing down Art's hand to a, a pretty narrow band here. He, he's got monsters, he's got removal. That, right. Those are really the only cards he could possibly have. And lands, but yeah. Yeah, well, more lands, but. So William has a Corsa of Crucifix, revealing another one. William chose not to play a temple uh, last turn Instead, playing a shock land, I think he's saving the temple to get a scry later, perhaps when he has Corsair out, to, to get a slightly more value out of it. <laughs> and Art has a hand of triple storm breath dragon and a dread boar. So he's going to go ahead and dread the Corsair there. I think I like that play. Plus, it uses your mana now, and if you draw a land next turn, you know what you're doing for your next three turns. Yep. And then Art also gets to play a scavenging ooze. Which, which is a solid play. I don't think that the Ooze is going to, you know, in the early game do a ton, but in the late game, it's actually bigger than all the other monsters. Right. So, so William does have another Corsair here that we saw last turn. He's going to go for it. He's going to reveal an Overgrown Tomb. He's going to play it and gain a life, even though he does have, uh, does have another Temple in, in, his, in his hand. So we've got uh, a Xenoghost is not the draw Art was looking for. He was looking he was looking to hit a land to play Stormbreath Dragon. Xenoghost's not awful. No, and it, it and its plus ability can actually provide mana, which right. comes up a reasonable amount of the time. The Seder token is not gonna attack So because of the Corsair, but Corsair plus or Seder token plus scavenging is will protect Xenoghost. I think I might even double block here if the Corsair attacks. I mean, I'll trade Scavenging Ooze for Corsair when you're tapping out every turn of the game. 
Well, what about Rampager? Rampager is a beating. Rampager might might make that a, a little a little too much. Like if he attacks Xenagos, you double block. He gets to Rampage. You put your Xenagos to one and kill both your creatures. And Corsair hit another Blood Crypt here. So Corsair has you know been two for two so far. Stormbreath Dragon, a fantastic play here for William because not only does it you know put him on the board, it also just gets to kill Xenagos right away. If Art doesn't hit a land here to play Stormbreath Dragon, he could be in trouble. He hits a land, but it's not the right one. No, it's not, not the land he was hoping for. And as good as temples are, and they are very good, they, they could be kind of backbreaking when you draw them, you know. Here, the Overgrown Tomb, he's going to scry to the bottom. That would have been a great draw just this turn. I was sort of hoping Art did draw a land so they could just both play Stormbreath, Stormbreath Dragons every we turn. We could just see Stormbreath just <laughs> punching each other back Yeah, exactly. Forth. Instead, with William basically up a Stormbreath Dragon and getting a first a turn to untap and do things, it's going to be pretty tough for, for Art to come back. I mean, it's possible, but, you know, William ha has been consistently hitting with Corsair here, which, you know, means he's drawing two cards a turn, essentially. Revealing a Domri Raid there. I mean, William might not have another, another big play this turn, or he might have a Xenoghost, God of Revels, one of the two. So he's also got a Reaper of the Wilds. So Xenoghost can come out and it can double the Stormbreath Dragon. And also it's going to presumably have Devotion next turn. Yeah, unless he has no permanence. Yeah. So Xenoghost comes out. Unfortunately, it can't give itself haste. It, <laughs> it's, not, it's not on yet, but Xenoghost will be active next turn. Yeah. And so this is eight damage from Stormbreath Dragon. If William hits another land, he can monstrous it, and do four or five from the Stormseeker, and attack with a 14-14. That's a literally an uncountable amount of damage. Yeah, well, for you. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Scavenging Goose, getting Art a little bit of life. He has at least one thing to do with it, but there's only actually been one creature dying so far, so it has, it's not going to do enough. Art's Courser is a, you know, a, little, a little late here. So you can, Art can play Stormbreath Dragon, but he's almost in a chump block mode already because of Xenagos. Yeah, I mean, if William has a land, he's literally in chump block mode. Yeah, and, he, and even if he doesn't, he has a Domri, so he can attack with a giant Stormbreath Dragon and then fight with it post-combat. Right, but I mean, even from Art's point of view, he, he has to play Stormbreath Dragon and say go, knowing that if William has a land, it just, he just tosses it in the graveyard, which is a tough spot to be in. <laughs> yeah, that, that's not really a spot you can come back from very easily. I mean, Art's best play still is Stormbreath Dragon, and still probably is just passing the turn, I guess? It's not a hopeful pass, but it's what he's got to do. And he does reveal a land from the Corsair of Krupix. As well as having six cards in hand. The fact that he's gotten to play lands off the top of his deck means he's got to have a bunch of lands in his hand, and he does. He has Temple, he's got Mutavolt, he's got another Temple. It looks like he's, he, he's, he's well-stocked. So Overgrown Tomb, only costing one life because of Corsair of Crucifix. So how many cards does Art have in his hand? Uh, I believe he has three. He has two Stormbreath Dragons and a, and a Corsair of Crucifix. And three's not going to be enough here. No, three's a little better than four. Because so if it was four, the Stormbreath Dragon's lethal without using the Xenagos pump. Yep, which, which would which, be... Which means he could use Xenagos on Corsair, have two attackers... So it looks like Xenagos himself is going to go ahead and fight Stormbreath Dragon here. Potentially. It looks like the dice came in at one, which really indicates what's happening. Yeah, he just wanted to take a minute and think about it. Yeah, there's no harm. Of course, William also has Dreadborn in his hand, so he can just, I think he can just end the game. He can yeah, he can. He can Dreadborn the Stormbreath Dragon or anything, fight one of the other things, use Xenagos on... I guess no, he, I guess he can't quite he end can't, the game. He can put him to one. I mean, he can figuratively end the game. He yeah, cannot literally right. end the game. Looks like he's just choosing to attack for eight, even keeping Xenagos back to potentially protect Domri. And it, it looks like the, it was the Rubbins. I don't think Domri even got used this turn. <laughs> Which, you know, was probably not necessarily the best line of play, but also completely irrelevant to the final outcome of the game. I agree, but... I mean, there's best practices, yeah. as Rowling would say. <laughs> 
So Art can play another Storm Breath. He could kill Domri with a Storm Breath, but I think that just puts him literally just dead on board. So, yeah. so, so understandably, Art packs him up, and they'll move on to a game two. So Art's got some options here for sideboard. I mean, besides like the, you know the normal miscutters and whatnot, you know the anti-control cards. He does have ultimate price. He does have uh, a couple other a couple other removal spells on the sideboard. I feel I feel like post-board games are going to look exactly like pre-board games um, in the sense that both players are just playing playing monsters and removing them. The removal gets better. Yeah, it gets exactly. more efficient. But monsters are still kind of what both deck is doing. I agree. They'll just still bash at each other's heads, but. You know, Doom Blades and Ultimate Prices and Putrefies or whatever people might yeah. happen to play do slow things down. They, I believe they increase the value of, like, Domri. Yeah. When you're able to play Domri and protect it, rather than, like we saw that game, play Xenagos and just have it die right away to a Storm Breath Dragon, you can really push the incremental advantages more than you can in maybe a game one. Right, and you also have cards like potentially Rakdos' Return, which can let you just play Karyatid, Karyatid, and then Rakdos Return, then play your monster after right. you use removal. The problem is when you're behind, Rakdos Return does absolutely nothing. I think it's still probably worth boarding in in this matchup. Yeah, it is likely worth boarding in, but uh, it is going to be a pretty high variance card. That's what it is. I mean, that's I how agree. it is in most matches. The decks aren't that fast. They're right. big. And, and Rakdos Return can wipe Planeswalkers, too. True. But yeah, like you said, they're not fast, which indicates Rakdos Return is, is a card you want to look at. Yep. So it looks like uh, game two is ready, so we're going to go back down and check out game two of the Jun Monsters Mirror. So it looks like they got slightly ahead of us. Uh, William Levin is up a game, and interesting seeing scavenging use out of our deck. That's one of the cards I would potentially look at uh, removing here. Well, do, do, I mean, well, the thing is, if you do play one of those long grindy games where you're trading removal for creatures, you're playing Rakdos Returns, you're both drawing off the top of the deck, Scavenger News becomes like, you know, random an 8 mana 8 8. Yeah. Yeah, I could see Scavenger News like be good as like a 1 of or a 2 of. Yeah. I, I can't imagine you'd want many more than I that. I agree with that. But also, it's like an 8 8 or a 9 9 that you can pay the mana for over several turns. Right. And I guess if. If both players are on cards like Rakdos Return, and actually, we see in Art's hand, he's got Sire of Insanity in his yeah. hand. If they're on cards like that, Scavenger Goose does get a lot better. So Art's going to go ahead and attack for three here, pumping his Scavenger Goose up, and then playing a post-combat Elvish Mystic. So Art could potentially play a Sire of Insanity next turn. It, if so, depending on what William does this turn, it's probably going to be pretty devastating. It is. William, of course, you know, has, has many options. He, he can either basically play a big monster, he, he's got a Mizzy Mortars there, and he's got to think about kicking the next turn. Oh, yeah. To kill the Ooze and the Elvish Mystic. But little does he know, he might not have a hand next turn. Right. I mean, Art, Art could just slam a Sire, and then that would be that. So, William taking two off the Stomping Ground, which could indicate something like a Storm Breath Dragon coming out. Looks like William also has his own Scavenging Ooze. Being the second Scavenging Ooze to the party is not generally as good. Sort of becomes like a green mana battle. <laughs> Whoever can force the other guy to keep activating his. I thought you were going to say green mana battery, and I was trying to figure out exactly how scavenging is was like green mana battery, which is a card from Legends. I know what green ma <laughs> mana battery is. I've done magic the puzzling. So William is going to go with the Mizzy Mortars to kill Art Scavenging Goose. He played Stomping Ground on tap so he could activate his own Scavenging Goose there. Seems reasonable. He gets ahead on board and... It doesn't do it that much against a giant threat, but Art doesn't draw land. He would have loved to slam Sire of Insanity, I think. I mean, William is down to three cards in hand, so he's trading. He'd be trading f two cards for three cards. Right, but also one of his cards is an ultimate price. One is a Pelucranos. Those are cards he can commit to the board. He can play Pelucranos, leave ultimate price up, kill a Storm Breath Dragon, and then try to play it or something like that. I'm not sure he necessarily has to discard all his cards here, especially given that they're creatures and he's facing a Scavenging Ooze. Had he, draw, had he drawn a land, obviously. Uh, now he clearly has no choice. Right. And now he's just going to play Pelucranos. I mean, that, that obviously is much better than casting Ultimate Prize. And that could leave him in better shape for the, for the Sire of Insanity if he does end up drawing a land. So William does grow the Scavenging Ooze here, getting a life. And William's options, are, looks like he's got, I mean, he's got a wealth of options. He's got Dreadbore for Pelucranus, it looks like. He's got Stormbreath Dragon, he's got Reaper of the Wilds. How do you generally feel about, like, playing a five-mana threat or using just a two-mana card and not really doing much else? I mean, the two-mana card is more impactful to the board. The five-mana card uses your mana so much better. 
It's tough. He's already at 14. He's staring down a Pelucranos. Though Pelucranos is large, it doesn't kill much when it fights here. That's true. And Pelucranos actually can just trade for Reaper of the Wilds. Re William does have that Sylvan Carriage ready to, to give Reaper Death Touch. Given that Art has another copy of Pelucranos in his hand, he's probably okay with that. Yeah. Looks like... I'm not, I'm not sure how happy I am to, to ultimate price of scavenging who's there. William going to take the opportunity to scry off Reaper of the Wilds. Looks like Art is going to play uh, Domri. Art. I think if I play Domri here, I, I think I, I would have been I would have been tempted to Domri and just fight the scavenging ooze, because he, he can fight Reaper of the Wild, but then uh -oh. he just trade off Death Touch. Yeah, I think that was a reasonable misstep. Given that if you attack, William's probably just going to block and trade. Yeah. So basically, you you lost a couple loyalty off Domri, and you lost the opportunity to plus one it and, and maybe draw a card. And the opportunity to potentially play another Pelucranos. Yeah, which would have actually been a little more impactful than Domri. And, th and that also get because William has Stormbreath Dragon, seems kind of hard to resist just eating Domri while you can. I mean, this isn't, this isn't really a, a, a race in terms of life total. Both players have so much removal post board that I would imagine you just want to go for a card advantage. So William opts to play an untapped Shockland in order to cast that Stormbreath Dragon. That's interesting. So he, he, he does that to save a life off Elvish Mystic, maybe block another uh, haste creature, but you pay two life to yeah. save one. And even I can do that counter. <laughs> <laughs> so Art once again betrayed by a Scry land, whereas he could play Sire of Insanity this turn if it was an untapped land. Not saying that would even necessarily be insane for him, but it would be okay. Right. Instead, he's going to play Pelucranos, which doesn't outrace Stormbreath Dragon, though Art, Art is, is at a higher life total. But William is both the aggressor and the head before Pelucranos hits the board. So. Art going to take his free attack, try to bluff something like a Rampager. Yeah, which is a reasonable bluff, though I think William's happy if Rampager is all that gets cast this turn. I agree. I think if you're William, you have to block, and if he has the Rampager, it's just so good for you. <laughs> yeah. <that. laughs> Art picking up the two lands and yeah. tapping them. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, yeah. Some gamesmanship. How come when other people do it, it's called gamesmanship? When I do it, it's called Bush League. <laughs> well, it is Bush. I mean, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> when you do it, it is Bush League. I will, I will allow it. <laughs> so William can't monster Storm Breath Dragon quite here. He can also kill Pelucranos. He's got, it looks like a dread boar that he hasn't had to use yet. Dread boar is going to kill Pelucranos. William could have played a second Storm Breath Dragon and smashed for, for eight there. But he was, I guess, worried about Pelucranos. Maybe, because Pelucranos does make Do Domri a more live draw. Right. So Art drawing Storm Breath, but Storm Breath is another card. It's really bad to be the second to the party there. You can't block them because they can Monstrous and they get the first giant hit in. So it's really hard to race when you're you know, a step behind with Storm Breaths. Though Art does know that you know, William doesn't have a land in hand. I mean, William could have played a, a, a land, but most of his land come to play tap, so he would have played it that turn. So it's unlikely that, uh, that he, he, he's going to be able to Monstrous Storm Breath unless he draws a land. Of course, that's you know something shallow to pin your hopes on, but you might have to. Right. <laughs> Again, he goes for it. Again, he picks up the lens. Yeah. I, I like it. <laughs> so the storm breath no attack is a, a somewhat desperate move here, especially since there's also so many removal spells. Wait, that's the storm breath reattack. The, the Elvish Mystic already attacked this turn. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sometimes bluffs do cost you equity. Yeah. <laughs> I mean. It was not a free bluff, as it turned out. Right. I mean, I, I thought he just was attacking because he was just going to play Storm Breath and leave it on defense. Right. That's, that that, 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 that yeah, seemed like I the mean, play. And again, that's not a, you know, a very satisfactory answer to another Storm Breath no, dragon. No, but it is a reasonable line to take here. Right. I think it is. If William doesn't have a, another land, he can't monster Storm Breath. Right. And then you can get to block. Right. Of course, if he doesn't have another land, he might have an ultimate price or a Dread Boar. Although, with William at 12, Storm Breath could hit him to 8. And then threaten lethal if William can't empty his hand and Art is able to draw land. And, uh, yeah, so the second Storm Breath might have worked. I think either way, William drew the Mizium Mortars. He's actually, looks like he actually might kick it here. No, he's, he's going to play a Corsair of Crew Fix instead. So I, I, I think I favor killing the elf just in case. Yeah, me too. But, I mean, with a Corsair and a, hitting a land off it and a Storm Breath Dragon. William is in pretty good shape. 
He's scrying a, another land at the bottom and revealing it looks like a forest. So Art's now behind against the Storm Breath Dragon. He's got Sire and he's got the Rampager that he's been bluffing. Yeah, this this is the like the unfortunate part of the bluff when you draw the card you were bluffing. If you've actually convinced your opponent, now they know what you have. Right. So Art could play the Sire of Insanity here. It looks like he's just gonna go for the Rampager to get the final hit in here. So Rampager tramples over a Karyatid, hitting hitting William for two there. And Art's left with an Elvish Mystic against a Stormbreath Dragon and a Corsair. And the Stormbreath Dragon's going to go monstrous next turn. William's in really good shape here. He gets the seventh land, he gains a life, and now there's a Stormbreath Dragon waiting on top of his library. So being able to monstrous here or play a second Stormbreath looks pretty good, though, of course, playing the second Stormbreath would make him William vulnerable to Mizium Warriors. So, I don't know, what do you think, Matt Sperling? <laughs> yeah. All right, Matt Sperling here, uh, stepping in for William Jensen as we prepare to switch transition from this when it concludes over to our coverage of the semifinals. Yeah, I've been, I've been watching this just off screen and I, I like watching a slugfest like this. Yeah, it, it